London Heathrow is the busiest international airport in the world. It handles nearly half a million flights and could easily feed the entire British population through its gates every year. For Heathrow to get this big, it took a series of major technological innovations. We have lined up seven landmark airports, historic giants of aviation. At the heart of each one lies a technology that allowed airports to feed ever more people through their gates, safely, quickly, and comfortably. One by one, traveling up the scale, we'll reveal the incredible stories behind these airports and the inventions that transformed them into sprawling, city-like structures. Seven ingenious leaps forward that enabled airports to evolve from big to bigger into the world's biggest. Heathrow Airport, Britain's gateway to the world, and a huge powerhouse for the country's economy. And now, it will get even bigger. T5, an immense new terminal that cost over $8 billion to build, is about to open. Lead architect Mike Davis can't wait. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. It's 19 years of work. It's all going to come to fruition when the first plane comes through. T5 has three huge terminal buildings assembled from 80,000 tons of steel. The main terminal is a true skyscraper of a terminal reaching 40 meters into the sky. This is a building of immense complexity. We had to satisfy the needs of 43 different groups of people to make sure that this building got a tick in the box from everybody. And you're talking about major systems like passenger check-in, then you've got the retail and various passenger services. We've got three big railway stations under this building. All of that has to be coordinated together. T5 will process 30 million passengers a year. It takes Heathrow's capacity to nearly 100 million travelers. To understand how Heathrow became this busy, we need to go back in time and look at how airports begin. The first big breakthrough comes with a small airport just outside London. Before it can get any bigger, Croydon Airport must make the sky above it safer. In 1920, Croydon is the main airport in London. Aviation is young and navigation primitive. Flying was really by seat of the pants. The pilot made use of landmarks such as coastlines, rivers, large towns, roadways. But the Mark I eyeball can't always be trusted. On the 7th of April 1922, a French pilot heading out of Paris airport drops below the clouds to get his bearings. Scanning the ground for landmarks, he doesn't realize that a cargo plane from Croydon is approaching on exactly the same heading. The first collision in the history of civil aviation kills seven people. It was an accident waiting to happen. Pilots would be looking out to see the road that they were following. They were looking over the side, the road was here. The other chap was looking over, maybe over the same side of the road, and they, they were really over the top of the road. 
To stop such disasters from ever happening again, Croydon invents a clever new technology. Every aircraft heading towards the airport sends out a radio burst. A radio receiver at Croydon then measures the angle of this signal, which reveals where the plane is coming from. I'm getting a call which is telling me that Croydon has a bearing of 140. So I'm taking out the mouse and placing it on a bearing of 140. But a plane's bearing isn't enough to pinpoint its precise position. So Croydon installs two more radio stations and their receivers lock on as well. Pullum are now calling. They have a bearing of 195. I can just hear Lim. Lim have a bearing of 230. I can see now that the strings cross at Hastings. The pilot is over Hastings. Once Croydon knows the plane's coordinates, they can safely guide it to the airport. This is the birth of air traffic control. In 1921, Croydon Airport had about 60 flights per week. Today, Heathrow pushes in up to 100 flights per hour. Air traffic control guides planes out of the sky and hands them over to the ground traffic controllers. They need to be able to see every single tail fin on the tarmac with their own eyes. This is where the construction of Terminal 5 creates a problem. The T5 buildings are so tall that controllers can't see the planes at the far end. They need a new, taller control tower right in the middle of the airport, one of the busiest crossroads at Heathrow. Turning it into a construction site would cause chaos for the aircraft. The only option is to build the new control tower on the edge of the airport and move it into position in one piece. But the tower weighs nearly a thousand tons. Moving it onto the airport takes months of careful planning. There is no margin for error. It was a great challenge to do it because we had to do it without stopping airline operations. Not a single aircraft should be rescheduled. We decided one great Friday evening to wheel it across the airport. And we took the fence down and rolled it out onto the apron. Just after Heathrow shuts down, the tower begins its two kilometer journey across the airport, balanced on three transporters designed to carry the space shuttle. The crew must deliver their precious cargo before the airport reopens in five hours. It was literally going two miles an hour. So at one point on that Friday night, we became the fastest building in the UK. Once safely in place over its foundations, engineers jacked the tower 87 meters up into the sky. Now air traffic controllers at Heathrow have a tower that lets them do their job without T5 getting in the way. Air traffic control technology allows more planes to reach airports safely. But as airports become cluttered with aircraft, it gets more difficult for passengers to board and disembark safely. For London Gatwick to take on 20,000 passengers, they need to bring planes and passengers closer together yet keep them apart. 
In the 1920s, air travel is only for the super rich. But conditions at the airfields are far from first class. They had to walk across a windy apron to reach the plane, so it was a fairly sort of primitive kind of activity, and it wasn't consistent with the pampered rich. Boarding planes isn't just inconvenient, it can be downright dangerous. Propellers and human bodies don't mix. But in 1933, a young man has an idea. Morris Jackerman wants to offer passengers at Gatwick Airport something revolutionary, a terminal. But he struggles to find the right shape for the building. You could imagine that he was, um, he was playing with all the variables and he was thinking about the way the aircraft would position themselves, taxiing in, and although that positioning of aircraft was good from the passenger's point of view, it wasn't good from the movement of the aircraft. Because if that aircraft is in position, that aircraft can't leave. If that aircraft is in position, that aircraft can't leave. And there's wasted space there. He just couldn't make the square work. And his father said, you're going around in circles, aren't you? And it was then that he had that eureka moment, that the circle is the solution. And here is the end product. It's still standing today, the beehive at Gatwick. Jackerman's design is revolutionary. Its shape is ideal for both passenger and plane. Each aircraft can quickly and independently taxi to its gate to unload, refuel and load up again. And inside the beehive, passengers wait in comfort until telescopic canopies take them right to the aircraft door. The Beehive is the first working airport terminal in the world. Heathrow Airport takes the idea of fast turnaround to the extreme. Planes rarely spend more than 90 minutes on the ground before taking off again. Every minute counts. At such a busy airport, the circular terminal quickly reaches its limits. A bigger circular terminal allows more planes to dock on the outside, but wastes a lot of space on the inside. Linking many small circles saves space, but a single broken down plane can block the path for many others. At Heathrow's Terminal 5, the beehive turns into the toast rack. It's a stack of rectangular buildings connected by underground trains, which keeps the taxiways clear. So if there's a problem, planes can simply taxi around it, saving valuable time. The design of Heathrow's Terminal 5 is deceptively simple, but constructing it is an extremely complex job. The site for T5 is as big as Hyde Park in London, but for an airport architect, it feels rather small. You'd never have picked this site for an airport building by choice. It's trapped between two live runways, some of the busiest in the world. It's inside the M25 on the west and the airport perimeter road. So you're in a box that you can't move out of, and it makes the building very, very complex. Mike Davis designs a 40-meter tall terminal. And to make the most of the space inside, he tops it with a single-span roof the size of five football fields. But raising this monster roof becomes one of the biggest challenges for the construction team. Just one piece of it weighs more than six jumbo jets. Lifting it up 40 meters with tower cranes would create a problem. The cranes would be so tall they would disturb the Heathrow radar system, which kicks in only three meters above the ceiling of T5. We can't poke cranes up into that area, otherwise you might collect undercarriages and so on. So basically we had to conceive a design which could really be built from below. 
The construction team assembled the roof sections on the ground with a series of small cranes. Then they use a clever lifting technology to pull the roof off the ground. It's called strand jacking. They suspend the sections in steel wires. These wires run through the strand jacks, powerful hydraulic rams that can each lift 185 tons. 16 of these jacks will painstakingly lift the roof section all the way up to the 10th floor. That's the plan anyway. On the 6th of April 2004, the construction team are ready for the first big lift. One of the problems of lifting a 2,200 ton plate, 110 by 56 meters high, is that it could warp. As you're going up, the thing can flex. So we had to lift it to within a centimeter, less than a centimeter on every jacking point. So we had to keep that absolutely perfectly flat as it went up. And when it got to the top, it had to be within very fine tolerances to be able to put the pins in and lock it off so it was, it was absolutely perfect. It takes almost a year to jack up all the roof sections. Over 18,000 tons of steel in total. But the effort pays off. The free floating roof maximizes the space inside. T5 has as much floor space as he throws four other terminals combined. The invention of the terminal speeds up passenger boarding and aircraft turnaround. Now the old propeller aircraft just can't keep up with passenger numbers. But then something arrives that changes everything. The jet. Jet planes carry more passengers but bring new challenges. To build an airport big enough for 150,000 passengers, Chicago needs a leap forward in runway design. Airlines of the 1950s love the new jets. They fly faster and further than even the most advanced propeller planes. But this new breed of airplane needs a new breed of airport. The engines of a Boeing 707 weigh three times more than those of a DC-3 propeller plane. It carries 19 times more fuel and eight times as many passengers. One 707 weighs as much as 13 DC-3s. Traditional runways just can't handle the colossal jets. When the city of Chicago plan a new airport for the jet age, they know that their runways need an upgrade to take on the jets. Engineers at Chicago O'Hare try to make their runway stronger by embedding steel cages into the concrete. But they can only hand build the runway in small sections, which is very slow and very expensive. Then they discover a marvelous machine that can lay concrete faster than any human being. The slip form paver. Slip form pavers can build runways in long strips without stopping. They are immensely fast and the concrete they lay is smooth, flawless and strong. Perfect for both engineers and jets. Heathrow's Terminal 5 will face the biggest leap in jet size since the Boeing 747. The Airbus A380, the world's largest passenger plane, seven stories tall 
and over 200 tons heavier than a jumbo jet. When the A380 is fully loaded, 560 tons of aeroplane push down onto the concrete. This plane stretches concrete technology to its very limit. To pave the apron at T5, engineers can't rely on normal concrete. The water in this concrete prevents the cement from bonding to the stones in the mix, so it will crack under the enormous weight of the A380. The only way around this is to make the concrete nearly a meter thick, way beyond the capacity of even the most advanced pavers. The pavement around T5 is bigger than 100 football fields. It would take over 62,000 truckloads of concrete to cover it. Financially and logistically impossible. So at T5, engineers use a new kind of concrete. It contains a soap-like liquid that displaces water and makes the bonds in the concrete stronger. This concrete can carry an Airbus A380, but only needs to be 60 centimeters thick. The new mix saves the engineers nearly 280,000 tons of concrete, and the pavement around Terminal 5 is now tough enough to take on the A380. But the jet brings another challenge for airports. No matter how advanced the planes, all jets have a soft spot. Their engines are so close to the ground that they can easily suck in objects lying on the runway. This can be fatal. On the 25th of July 2000, Concorde, the biggest icon in aviation, becomes the victim of a small metal strip picked up from the runway. 114 people die in the disaster. To keep jets safe, airports must keep their runways squeaky clean. The two runways at Heathrow are probably the most precious stretches of tarmac in the UK. With half a million takeoffs and landings every year, they run at 99% capacity. Their safety ultimately depends on two sets of eyeballs. The men of the inspection team must scour the tarmac for foreign objects whilst the runways are fully operational. Anything that shouldn't be on the runway does tend to stand out. You do notice something which should not be there. Just pull up there, Jim, I'll grab that. That's the sort of problems that we pick up. Polystyrene and melt down onto the turbine blades. The aircraft might be grounded. Another inspection done, and Heathrow's runways remain probably the cleanest stretch of road in the country. The invention of the jet allows airlines to carry more passengers for less money. But jets take up more space than smaller propeller planes, so the terminals must grow larger. Reaching the plane soon becomes a test of endurance. Flying now involves too much walking. To process three million travelers comfortably, Dallas Love Field needs to speed up its passengers. In the 1960s, airports grow bigger than ever to make space for the large jets so big that the passengers get left behind. Passengers actually began to complain about the fact that they had to walk such a long distance. Uh, for example, uh, in the United States O'Hare Airport in Chicago, if you imagine having to walk from the furthest gate to make a connection at the, at the opposite end of the airport and with a tight connection, 
Well, you wouldn't walk, you would run. But even running, you wouldn't probably be able to make that kind of connection. The size of the airport is simply too large. When Dallas Love Field builds a corridor half a kilometer long, they realize that passengers need an easier ride. They find inspiration in a California quarry. Rocks from this quarry travel over 15 kilometers on the world's longest conveyor belt to the Shasta Dam. If rubber can carry rocks, surely it can carry people. So the engineers at Love Field fit their corridors with a rubber conveyor. They put wooden pallets running along rails under the rubber belt to give passengers a solid platform. They call it the glide ride. Driven by a single motor, the belt carries passengers to their gates effortlessly. When Love Field opens, 200,000 sightseers come to admire the world's first moving sidewalk at an airport. The airlines were certainly very, very positive and very happy about the result because their passengers moved more quickly to the terminals and also they were happier. Today, the problem of moving people extends far beyond the airport itself. Now, getting passengers to the terminal is the weakest link in the transport chain. Heathrow's Terminal 5 features a revolutionary but highly experimental transport system, PRT, or Personal Rapid Transport. They're, they're very much like little robots, they're like robot taxis. They're intelligent, they have onboard computers, they can sense their surroundings. At a test track in Wales, engineers put the PRT system through its paces before installing it at T5. The concept of PRT sounds almost too good to be true. Battery-powered pods that shuttle four passengers to the terminal every three seconds, without a driver and without crashing into each other. Every second, a laser measures the distance to the curb thousands of times. A computer then turns the wheels to keep the pod in the center of the track. Metal loops in the track detect the exact position of each vehicle. So if a pod gets too close to the one in front, the PRT central computer brings it to a stop. At Heathrow, the robots first roll out on a small scale. 18 PRT pods will speed passengers from the business car park to Terminal 5. But the system may soon connect the whole airport and carry hundreds of thousands of people each day. When it comes to numbers, almost nothing beats the pods. And when you compare it to something like a bus, well, a bus may have 50 seats. But if you only have a bus every five minutes, that's only 600 seats in an hour. Whereas with these, at four seats every three seconds, you're talking you know, over 1,200. So in fact, you have a large capacity in the system which appears to operate in a very gentle way. If PRT succeeds at Heathrow, it may well extend its reach far beyond the airport to relieve congestion in our inner cities. As moving walkways speed up passengers inside airports, more and more people take to the skies. But in the late 1960s, skyjackers discover that planes are perfect targets, vulnerable and valuable. To keep 14 million people flowing through Atlanta International, the airport needs to radically tighten its security. In 
In 1970, Palestinian terrorists capture three jets and take them to the Jordanian desert. Basically, anybody who wanted to get on a plane could. Anybody could carry a gun to the plane very easily. A new kind of war begins. People are afraid to fly, and the airlines were in danger of losing a large part of their business. The U.S. government decides to fight back. They put armed sky marshals on their planes. The flying pigs, that's what we called ourselves. Over 2,000 of us were hired uh, and quickly given six weeks of training. We had a makeup of an aircraft with passengers in the seats, and you'd have to learn how to shoot around the passenger, step down and shoot so you wouldn't shoot innocent passengers. Soon, Jerry Worley confronts his first suspect. All of a sudden, he stood up where he was talking and went for the cockpit door. So I put my gun up. I'm going to ask him to stop one time. Then I'm going to shoot him in the back. And uh, all of a sudden, they understood him. He was sick and wanted to find a restroom to throw up. He went for the wrong door. The restroom door was on the right. He went for the cockpit door, and I'd almost shot him. A well-aimed shot can bring down a skyjacker, but a stray bullet may bring down a plane. Pitting guns against guns is not the ideal solution. Skyjackers must be stopped at the airport before they board a plane. This creates a huge problem at the busiest airport in the world, Atlanta International. It now has the mammoth task of spotting among over 14 million passengers the one with sinister intentions. The only safe way of doing this is to hand search every single passenger, which would bring the airport to a grinding halt. They desperately need a faster way of spotting hijackers. The solution comes from an unexpected place, the sawmill. The thousand dollar blade of the head saw is the heart of the operation. Even a small metal object hidden in the wood can break the blade and bring the mill to a complete standstill. It's very costly to me because there's going to be 20 men that just sit down because there's nothing to do while they're waiting for the saw to be changed. So before the logs get anywhere near the saw, they must pass through a metal detector. Anything suspicious triggers an alarm. The log then comes offline for a spot check. This nail here, you can actually see a little bit of it sticking out. Sometimes they're completely submerged. It's not uncommon to get up to a dozen a day. Another thing we find in logs is bullets. Uh, there's a lot of hunting goes on around here, and a lot of times people miss their game. They shoot it into a tree, you know, and then I find it with my metal detector. A machine that detects nails and bullets is exactly what airports need. The metal detector uses a large electric coil to produce an electromagnetic pulse. Any metal caught in the pulse reflects a magnetic echo. A sensor picks up this signal and triggers an alarm. What works for logs also works for air travelers. Now airports can spot the skyjackers without having to hand search everyone. But metal detectors are not the final solution to the security problem. They mark the beginning of an arms race between technology and terror. Even as the machines improve, criminals are finding ways to outwit them. On the 22nd of December 2001, the FBI arrest a man who tried to explode a homemade bomb on board a plane. 
Richard Reed had filled his shoes with plastic explosives and smuggled them through security. But today there is technology that can deal with people like the shoe bomber. Archway detectors use jets of air to dislodge particles from hair and clothing. Then they suck them into a detector that sniffs out even minute traces of explosives. And backscatter X-ray machines penetrate only the clothes, but not the skin, to reveal hidden objects. Security is the number one concern for airports today. Attacking an airport doesn't just hurt people, it can hurt an entire economy. T5 will have special X-ray scanners to check over 80,000 passengers every day. The machines use multi-beam X-rays to measure the atomic weight of every single baggage item. Then they automatically highlight suspicious items which speeds up the scanning process and hopefully gives passengers more time to do something fun before they board their plane. The introduction of security checks in the 1970s reassures travelers that flying is safe. More and more people take to the skies, which brings the next big challenge for airports. There are even more bags than travelers. To keep those bags moving at Los Angeles International, the airport needs to make a big technological leap into the future. In 1975, Los Angeles International processes nearly 24 million passengers a year and twice as many bags. A nightmare for baggage handlers. But Los Angeles has found a way to crack an age-old problem. For years, airlines dream of sorting baggage automatically, but they just can't find a machine that can read baggage tags. Then in the summer of 1974, a pack of gum shows the way forward. It's the first product fitted with a new technology called a barcode. Product information is encoded in white lines between black bars. The lines reflect the light of a laser scanner, which is picked up by a sensor. A computer then deciphers the code and displays the price. This seems the perfect solution to baggage sorting at airports. But when Western Airlines introduced the barcode at Los Angeles, there is a problem. The tag can be anywhere on a bag, even under it. So they fire lasers at the bags from every angle, even from below. A central computer then processes the tag data and directs each bag to the right aircraft. Now that machines can read bag tags, baggage handling becomes much faster. But it's not foolproof, as it still relies on having human beings in the loop. That's why today, airlines in the US alone still mishandle over three million bags every year. Heathrow's Terminal 5 will process over 4,000 pieces of luggage per hour Bags of all shapes and sizes need matching to hundreds of planes going to dozens of different destinations. A logistical nightmare. Heathrow Airport has a bad reputation for mishandling baggage, so T5 simply must deliver. Your world is in your bag when you're going abroad. It's your, your security, your assurance, and your, your clothing for wherever you're going, so it's critical that it works well and it, every bag joins up with its passenger. T5 has the largest baggage system in the world. 
a monstrous maze hidden in the bowels of the terminal. It has eight kilometers of high-speed baggage track and 18 kilometers of conveyor belt. The system costs nearly half a billion dollars and the whole terminal is literally built around it. System architect Ian Bailey has spent 13 years developing the system and the last eight months testing it. Today, he's taking his baby to the edge with 12,000 bags. We're trying to deal with the baggage as, as though it was a passenger's bag. Each bag is labelled up, each bag is associated to a flight, and each bag technically represents a passenger. Twelve thousand bags to be processed in four hours takes the system right to its breaking point. It's just like a sponge. The more you put in, the more it will soak, and then there's a point where it can't soak up anymore. So the 12,000 bag limit is roughly the point where the sponge starts to get full. The baggage handling machinery at T5 is extremely complex, but it has a very simple innovation right at the beginning, a high-speed check-in. In the traditional airport layout, a baggage belt runs behind the check-in desks, blocking the passenger's path. In T5, that conveyor runs on the floor below, and from check-in, the bags drop down in baggage hoists. This logistical masterstroke allows passengers to walk straight through the check-in, speeding the journey of millions of travelers. Rather than being funneled like they would normally be at other airports, what this facility allows you to go straight through and onto your aircraft. Even such an advanced system still relies on good old-fashioned barcode scanners. They identify each bag so a central computer can track and control its journey. It always knows where every bag is in the system and who it belongs to. At least that's what the designers hope. If the system fails, it could bring down the whole terminal with it. In 1993, Denver Airport introduced fully automated bag handling, but the expected triumph of technology turned into a disaster. Bags kept flying off the conveyors, jamming the system. Denver had to delay the opening of the airport for a whole year, costing the city a million dollars every day. Heathrow needs to do better than Denver. So just in case, T5 has a second bag system, just as vast as the other. Heathrow has a special baggage problem, the bags of passengers who only pass through the airport. This is an airport where nearly a third of passengers are transit passengers. Now, with a big, high-performance baggage system, the last thing you want is lots of bags rolling around the system for six hours whilst the chap's, you know, having a lunch and shower. So there's this amazing system which takes the bags off the main lines and stores them temporarily, called the Early Bag Store. It's a technological wonder. The Early Bag Store can hold 4,000 bags and is run by robots. The machines automatically retrieve the bags and send them to their flight. To make sure they reach their plane in time, bags switch from slow conveyor belts to high-speed trolleys, which take them underground to the Terminal 5 satellites. Running on magnetic accelerators, they reach over 30 kilometers an hour. This system aims to get each bag from check-in to the plane in less than 15 minutes. In today's trial, all 12,000 bags emerge on schedule. A good omen. At Terminal 5, lost bags will be a thing of the past, so they hope. Heathrow began like many other airports on a grassy field. 
Originally designed to accommodate 45 million passengers per year, today it handles 68 million. T5 is supposed to help Heathrow deal with the numbers, but it must be more than just an efficient people processor. Airports today must reclaim the magic they have lost in their quest to expand. A hundred years ago, air travel started as an adventure for the rich and famous. Now, it's a global industry. And often, that's what passengers feel like at an airport, processed like merchandise, passed from one queue to the next. As airports have grown, they've lost their soul. The architects of T5 hope that their terminal will restore both magic and simplicity to air travel. It's really a great single hall. You arrive in a single place, and many of the airport experiences you have at the moment, you go into this box, and then that box, and then the next box, and then the next box, and orient disorientation sweeps in here. You understand where you are. You're only in one room, one relatively simple space, so you can see everything that's happening for 16 aircraft around this building right here. T5 is a piece of high-tech architecture, but its simple shape may just be the future of airport design. This will change over time. This is a city that over the next 30 or 40 years will continuously respond to whatever happens in the industry. You've got a loose fit box within which you should be able to adapt the life of the interior continuously over time. Who knows what air travel will be like in 30 years' time? If you look 30 years back, by gosh, how much it's changed.